Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now, my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If If you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John o. White, or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader, and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult, and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Alec Coles. Alec is the Chief Executive Officer of the Western Australian Museum. Welcome to the podcast, Alec. Thanks, Jono. Pleasure to be here. Yes, it's wonderful to have you on. I'm excited to to chat with you a bit about your journey and a bit about what you do, and that's probably a great place to start. Can you tell our listeners who uh, you know might be from around the world, not just uh, in Australia, just a little bit about what you do at Western Australian Museum? 
Okay, so the Western Australian Museum is actually an organization of about eight sites, seven of which are public museums. Uh, so I'm based here in Perth, uh, down in the, uh, the southwest of the state, uh, the state capital. We've got our headquarters building, Bulabadip, here. Bulabadip means many stories in the local uh, Aboriginal Noongar language. Uh, and that opened to the public just over a year ago, that's back in 2020. Uh, we have a couple of uh, museums down in Fremantle, which is, if you like, the port city associated with Perth. And then we've got museums in Albany, Kalgoorlie, Geraldton, uh, and we run an Aboriginal cultural centre up in Carnarvon there. For those who aren't familiar with WA, uh, it's a very big place. Uh, um, it's about a third of the landmass of Australia and is equivalent probably to the size of Western Europe. So um, although we only have a population of 2.5 million people, um, you know, they're pretty widely spread and servicing a state like that uh, has its challenges. And we also do a lot of work um, behind the scenes that people wouldn't necessarily be aware of. So we're very much at the forefront of uh, uh, studying the biodiversity of our state, which is extraordinary. The southwest of our state is one of the world biodiversity hotspots. Uh, and also some of the um, incredible maritime archaeology uh, of, of the state. And of course, we work extensively with uh, First Peoples, with uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities here in WA in terms of uh, cultural materials. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And, and I'm excited. One of the things I'm excited about chatting with you is that this may be the first time some of our listeners from around the world um, are aware of, of um, the amazing work you're doing there at the Western Australian Museum and, and all the different locations. So thank you for giving us a quick overview. Uh, let's chat about you. I'm, I, I love to start when, I, when it comes to someone's story to go back to growing up. Um, so if you think back to Alec when you were growing up, is there anything that comes to mind in terms of your, your passion uh, that, that sort of comes from family. That's what I know we had a quick chat about before we press record. Tell us a little bit about uh, about that, Alec. Yeah, so I guess what has, uh, it, it's interesting, it's moments in your life that really determine, I suppose, one's progression, one's interest. And literally when I was about four years old, we lived with my grandparents uh, in the UK, uh, in Shropshire. And um, my um, my grandfather had a small holding. It was only about 18 acres, uh, but in those days you could actually eke a living out of something uh, that big. Wouldn't be able to do so today, I'm afraid. Uh, and so uh, certainly before I was going to school, I would spend time out with him in the fields. Uh, we'd be managing the hedges, cutting the grass, looking after the livestock. Um, I had my own little uh, flock of bantam chooks that I looked after. And uh, it really created a love of the environment for me. And I suppose uh, that's really determined my progression ever since. I, I got into museums really as a, a natural science curator. Uh, and um, in between my museum career, I, I ran a um, wildlife trust in the UK uh, for a while. And um, yeah, I, I, I love the countryside. And, and the great thing about Western Australia is, is it's, it's about... Uh, two and a half million uh, square kilometres and there's about two and a half million people live here so that's one person per square kilometre so there's there's plenty of open space here to uh, to enjoy yeah that's uh it's it certainly is an incredible place to live uh i'm interested to know you mentioned your grandfather and how that had such a uh i guess that was really formative for you I, i'm always i'm always fascinated because i love the connection between you know, that we never make at the time, but when you look back in hindsight, you can often see this direct link like you've just talked about. Are there any moments in particular that come to mind that were really formative for you when you were growing up that really stand out that um, that you think, oh, that was a real aha moment for me or or something that I've never forgotten that, that helped me to end up doing what I'm doing? Well, I suppose, yeah, there are, there are a lot of moments during that period uh, that I can recall, uh, as I say, being out in the fields, we would, um, what they would call in the, the UK, laying hedges, which was actually, you would actually manage the, the hedgerow shrubs to make sure you got a, a good um, stock proof uh, natural barrier. And I, I remember that distinctly. 
uh, so I be became a botanist much later in life. And I suppose the other thing is when I was, uh, uh, I suppose, about 11 or 12, uh, again, growing up in a rural part of the United Kingdom, uh, I visited London with the school for the first time and we went to the British Museum. And uh, I remember the uh, uh, Tutankhamun exhibition was on at the time. And uh, really, it was the first time I'd visited anything like that at all. And uh, certainly for me, uh, that was a defining moment and uh, kind of look where I ended up. Yeah, that's incredible. That must have been, that must have been just uh, breathtaking to see that at that mm. age. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, it was, it was very, very special. And, and, you know, it was back in the days before we had... Uh, well, before we had computers, basically, or certainly we had personal computers, certainly before the internet. So none of this was yeah. available to us. And it's something, I guess, that's driven my uh, passion for museums uh, throughout my life is the fact that they deal with uh, authenticity, with real objects, real stories, real people. And you get to experience that in a social situation. So it's all very well being able to access you know, anything you like on the web or through Google, but there's no substitute for being in front of the real thing or he hearing the story from the real person uh, and actually yeah. being able to share that experience with people. I'm interested to know from your childhood and, and growing up, we're obviously chatting about leadership, but I'm, I always love chatting about the topics that leaders are most passionate about that's why it's been great to hear how some of your interests developed specifically around leadership and managing people are there any lessons that you learned from what you've just described about your childhood and growing up where you did doing what you did are there any lessons that you learned from that stage of life that you think have really proven to be helpful for you as a leader oh, look, again I, I would would um go back to my mother who uh has a, um, you know, was always um, somebody who would, you know, would never speak ill of anyone else, was incredibly tolerant. Uh, I, I want to describe as a bit of a saint in a, an interview I did, similar to this. And it just teaches you respect. Uh, I, I, I kind of, one of the things that, that I, I suppose um, I find uh, frustrating and unpleasant is you know when people uh, are unduly critical of their colleagues or talk about them behind their back or whatever I just think it's all about respect and that's something that my, my mother taught me and uh, you know as a leader you have to gain respect but you only do that by giving respect as well yeah that's great you've got to gain respect but you only you only get that by giving respect I think that's um you know, even in the past few days, I've actually been chatting with a leader about, uh, you know, uh, someone uh, in the UK and they've got a team member who is um, has just been struggling a little bit with their team. And it actually, it's come down to this. It's so funny. It's even at the most senior levels of leadership, I think someone's just come in pretty new to a team and, and not really respected some of the seniority of some of the people in their team. And and they haven't really given that respect. And, and as a result, they're a high capacity, talented leader, but they're, there's just some struggles interpersonally. And I think this is why it's so simple as they didn't, they didn't come in in a respectful manner, uh, which sounds like, and there's so many other things they'd be so skilled at, but they just dropped that one ball and it's created a few sort of high level challenges. Well, well look, it's, you know, it, it, it sounds a bit like motherhood and apple pie, but you really should, treat people treat people the way you expect to be treated yourself um you know whether that's leading by example or, or however you want to express it uh the fact is that in any team whether it's a management team or whether you know, middle management uh, executive management or, or or anywhere in an organization uh you know, we're always going to be more productive if we work harmoniously together that doesn't mean to say we all need to love each other but we need to respect each other uh, we need to be able to be mm. honest with each other uh, and uh, ultimately I, I guess that's where um, where this lands and, and it is unfortunate I mean I know I, I've seen 
in my time, uh, and I've been lucky to work under some fantastic leaders. Uh, so I've kind of observed this from afar in other organisations, people who want to come in and you know, make revolutionary change. Sometimes it's required, but usually, and particularly yeah. in the field that I work in, um, knowledge is at a premium. Yeah, you know, quite often the the most effective curators are the ones who you know know their collections best and have been around for for quite a long time. So the idea that you throw everything up in the air and start again is is kind of anathema in that organisation. And I think that or that kind of organisation. Mm. And I think yeah. the the fact is that uh, everyone has uh, something to offer, and you really need to find those those, those common uh, common places. And certainly where you've got uh, experience and seniority you should you should recognize it i mean another not unrelated element to this is is the ability to listen uh it is the i've I got a got a former colleague who, uh, i mean it's, it's probably a common phrase but i hadn't heard it before they always used to say um you've got <clears throat> you've got two ears and one mouth and that should be a clue um and uh, uh you know you need to be able to listen and that means listen that, uh, uh, you know, and act upon what you hear and be prepared to change your thinking based upon what you hear. Yeah, that's so good. Um, and it's funny, I, I'd say fifty in 50% of these podcast episodes, listening comes up as uh, how a reminder of how important it is or as something that, that a leader really under underestimated and learn over their career. And, and it's, I think it you can't, exaggerate the importance of listening if you can listen well as a leader it can create so it's the it's really the foundation of great relationships and i feel like uh not listening well is often the foundation of so many problems that end up happening in a team or in an organization no i, I think <clears throat> i think that's um that's absolutely true and, and, and it's uh, there's nothing more frustrating for people than feeling they've got something important to say and you know not being listened to and you do see this in meetings um uh from time to time where you know people either won't be listened to or they'll say something and it it's it's almost swept under the table uh you've got to, you've got mm. to be uh, respectful and honest and uh you know even if you don't agree with what it is you at least need to be able to respond and explain that uh, there's nothing worse than being kind of fobbed off. Yeah, I agree. So if we fast forward a bit for you, do you, I'm interested to know, when was your first role where you felt like you were really stepping out as a leader? Um, obviously, leadership is influence. I love that idea from John Maxwell. So I think any, I, I'm a big believer that people can really develop as a leader and anyone listening who's passionate about that can do that. But there's often a time where you go, okay, wow, now I'm responsible for this project or I have to cast vision or I've got a team of people or I have one person reporting to me. I have volunteers that I'm in charge of in a, something that I'm helping out with. Do you remember for you, what was that first sort of experience of leadership? Yeah, um, look, I, I mean, like you're suggesting, I mean, I believe leadership should happen at every level of an organization. You know, everyone has a, a role to play in some kind of leadership. Uh, we just need to make sure that that's, you know, all of that uh, is, is harmonious throughout the, the organization. I mean, for me, uh, I'm trying to think probably, I mean, we, back in, gosh, we're going way back now, um, in the 1980s, uh, I worked in a small museum uh, uh, in a place called Western Supermare, a Wood Spring Museum. And uh, we yep. did some project work at that time. There were lots of uh, schemes. There were kind of jobs creation schemes for people. Uh, you know, unemployment was, was at quite a high level then. So there was a lot of, sort of public money going into job creation schemes. And so we had a, um, a project uh, that was uh, working on a, an Iron Age hill fort there, which had been completely overgrown. So it was really trying to... Uh, rehabilitate that so I guess that's the first time I had a, a significant team of people to uh, to lead in that respect and that was yeah it was challenging um, I was you know relatively um, 
uh, inexperienced at that time, so it was uh, very much a kind of learn as you go situation. Uh, later, <laughs> I mean, I, I took on major projects uh, when I was with Tarnawir Museums, as they were called at the time. Uh, we um, uh, developed the Great North Muse uh, uh, Great North Museum, uh, and that was a, 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 a huge um, uh, kind of opportunity for me. Um, I had two stints with, with Tiny Weir, once as a, a curator uh, on the sort of senior management team, and that's when we started really the, the idea behind this big capital program that we eventually uh, delivered. I then went off to run a wildlife charity, the Northumberland Wildlife Trust, and that was that was really yeah. important for me because it was very close to my, well, my passion that I've described before. Uh, but it was also I, I'd always worked in the public sector in the UK, so to move out of the public sector into the so-called third sector, a charitable organisation, uh, which very much had to, mm. um, you know, run on its own two feet. Uh, had to deal with you know, issues of cash flow and things, which you never had to in a in a big way in the public sector, uh, and um, that was a great learning experience for me. I loved my time at the Wildlife Trust, and uh, uh, you know it was. Um, I would have stayed there a lot longer if the opportunity to go back to Tyne and Weir uh, Museums as director hadn't uh, hadn't come up, which is what happened, and that's uh, where I went back to. Uh, we merged with the archives, so it became Tiny Weir Archives and Museums. And then I, I came yeah. out here to Australia to lead the WA Museum, which again was a big change for me. I, I didn't know Australia. Uh, I had to, you know, deal with a whole range of new challenges. Uh, and it's it's really about being able to pick up those challenges as you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated by your story. What What did you find... What were the biggest differences between leading in public sector and leading in the third sector, leading in not-for-profit? Well, I, I think, as, as I say, in the public sector and, um, you know, with no um, disparagement of any of the colleagues I've ever worked with, uh, but the public sector can be quite a cosy place, ultimately. It doesn't always feel that way, uh, but... You know, it, certainly in the UK, you know, it was sort of at that time, and things certainly changed um, in, in later years. But um, you know, people had uh, reasonable job security, they had a final salary pension, and um, you know, if you wanted to stay in that that sort of uh, situation, you probably had that opportunity. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a job for life, but it probably was for some people. And obviously the, the voluntary mm. sector is a much more, well, it's, it's a much less secure environment, sometimes a bit of a febrile environment. Um, and, and as I say, I mean, I remember, you know, if, if you were working in the, the public sector, you'd, you know, you'd start the beginning of the year, you'd have a budget, you might get some cuts through the year, but generally, you know, you had a budget and that was what you would work to. Uh, in the third sector, you've got to earn your money. And I remember, you know, when I arrived, we had, I think we had about um, assets sufficient to pay our staff for about two or three months. Uh, and we really had to uh, put it on a, a much sort of stronger foot, footing um, than that, which we did. Uh, but it's just, yes. um, it just brings everything into focus. And uh, for me, it was, it was probably um, one of the most important uh, uh, part of my leadership development because it, it, it kind of showed me the other side and, and, and furnished me with a whole lot of experience and skills that I probably hadn't picked up prior to that. Yeah, incredible. I can see how um, different that would be, but uh, how complimentary they'd be. As you think of your career so far, are there any leaders that come to mind who really mentored you or you just admired or you worked closely with and, and really learnt a lot from? Yeah, look, I, I, I always cite um, two people in particular. Um, and, uh, well, certainly in terms of, of leaders that I actually worked for. Uh, so my first boss in my first 
full-time job down in uh, in Western Supermare was a woman called Jane Evans, and uh, she taught me um, the 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 community benefit uh, of museums. She was absolutely at the heart of the community. She was out there. She she taught me some bad habits as well, which was kind of you know working too long and too late. Um, but uh, but yeah. she absolutely um, you know appreciated that community value. And and when I went to um, uh, Tiny Weir Museums, as it were, I went as a natural science curator uh, back. Um, gosh, that would have been the back end of the eighties. And um, uh, after a couple of years, uh, we had a new director, a guy called David Fleming. Um, and uh, David's still a, a, a good friend of mine, and um, he uh, he was very much in the same vein in terms of, I suppose the way I would express it, a lot of people that I encountered in museums um, were were absolutely about. They were there because they were interested, uh, you know, in the collections which is great because you need people who are interested in collections and people who know the collections. But I probably hadn't encountered enough people who were, if you like, user focused. You know, what, what, what was the point of a museum? What was it there for? What could it do? How could it change people's lives? Yeah. And David was the person, I think, who uh, for a whole uh, bunch of us uh, demonstrated that. Uh, he was also uh, a kind of, political operator at the time in a way that I think none of us had seen uh, before then. And so I um, was, uh, you know, I, I certainly owe him a great deal in terms of the way I um, operate and the way that I, I suppose um, I think of museums. I mean, the other thing I, I would um, uh, just highlight, I mean, I've, I've been lucky uh, along the way uh, with uh, governing bodies as well. So uh, I had a couple of uh, chairs of my governing committees. So back in the Wildlife Trust, um, I called uh, Graham Taylor, who was the chair of the... Um, and Graham was also the CEO of the National Parks at that time up in uh, uh, in the northeast. And, um, uh, and the great thing is when you have somebody like that as your chair, that, you know, they've, they've seen it from both sides. And they recognise the difference between management and governance and executive and non-executive roles. And um, it's really important for any uh, leader in a CEO position to have a great relationship with their chair. I'm, I'm pleased to say I've always had that with all my chairs, as I do now, uh, yes. with, uh, with Melissa yes. Park, who is the chair of the museums at the moment. But, um, but that's the key thing. I've seen people in other organisations where um, if that relationship doesn't work, you frankly, you're stuffed. Uh, and, and too often you see uh, people in governance roles, in, in, in uh, chair, you know, chair roles, who kind of haven't quite understood the difference <laughs> between uh, uh, leading a, <laughs> you know, a board and actually uh, being the CEO of an organisation. And I've certainly had colleagues who've suffered from, from that in the past. Yeah, it's interesting you, you mentioned that. I was um, just recording a podcast as a guest today with a uh, on a great nonprofit, the Nonprofit Lowdown, I think it's called, with a, a uh, an executive director of a nonprofit in New York. She runs this um, podcast, and we were talking about how do you do conflict well uh, with boards as the as the executive director. So this is this topic's been on my mind, and I think it's it's a big challenge. What have you learned about how to lead up well to a board? I think it's it's all about communication. It's about keeping people in the loop. It's about being transparent. It's about effective reporting. It's about achievement because you've got to uh, you've got to uh, um, be uh, you know obviously the board is holding you to account. You're accountable to that, and and uh, so you need to be able to to hit your targets as well. But but so much of it is about relationship building. And, you know, I, I, maybe I've just been lucky all my life, but I've, I've always had a really good relationship with uh, both the chairs and the board members I've had. And uh, as I said, I like to think it's because, uh, you know, we work hard at working together and making sure 
you know, people are well informed and understand uh, the issues before us. And, you know, you've got that trust and integrity. Again, I've seen, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but you do see uh, CEOs uh, around about who, who try and, you know, they, they try and keep things from their boards or they're maybe not quite as transparent as they should be. And, I, you know, that, that yeah. You know, that can only lead to madness and disaster. You've you've got to have that complete trust between the the the, uh, uh, the the governing body and the the management executive. And if you haven't got it, then you know you want to hide into nothing. Yeah, that's that's such good advice. And I think communication is um, is so crucial. Uh, I'm, I'm interested. I think you mentioned was it Jane yeah. and David mm-hmm. the two people that you talked about. Are there any stories that come to mind from working with Jane or working with David, specific moments where you, for some reason, it really stuck with you how they managed a situation or how they dealt with a stakeholder or or uh, handled the team? Is there anything that comes to mind as a specific story with either of them? Oh, look, I think um, the uh, what I observed with David for or several years was... Uh, the way in which he managed up um, to the uh, committee that he worked with. And, um, you know, interestingly, not only brought along, but converted a number of people to, uh, uh, you know, to understand what was possible. And, And it was, again, if I think back, and obviously I wasn't sort of, privy to all the conversations that he had but it it, it was about uh, again just building that communication um, regular communication meaningful communication and I mean I'm, I'm always yeah. uh, you know whatever it is you're doing and particularly when you're in receipt of the public purse yeah you know, you've got to be able to demonstrate your value in every sense your public value I always say with the WA Museum, I mean, we say we completed in 2020 uh, a $400 million uh, redevelopment of our main museum, uh, which is uh, was a, you know, it's a huge project. And uh, it took a long time to persuade governments to get behind it, and they did in the end, which is fantastic. Uh, but for me, that was about... Uh, you know, moving away from that idea of, as I always described it, entitlement and victim culture. You know, it's that kind of thing. Oh, well, the government's got to fund the museum and it's so unfair <laughs> they don't give us enough money. Moving away from that yes. into, well, you know, what can the museum do for the government? What can it do for the population? And I guess, you know, that's something that I observed with David, that he, he you know, he, like I have done, uh, turned that argument round. Uh, it was all about demonstrating value rather than demonstrating need. Mm. I love that, and that's. Um, I think that's. There's a. There's something to that in, like you said, because of the inherited, and and I guess it would be easy for that to become the go-to angle to look at things. It must have been. It must have been challenging, and must be challenging in in a role like yours in an organisation like yours to really create that sense of no we're here to create value yeah look i i mean i I cannot praise the museum stuff highly enough uh and interestingly the um the development of w museum boulevard here uh i say 400 million dollar scheme uh we had a project team but obviously all our curatorial team conservators our, our marketing teams all you know Everybody played a part in in this, and we had to work at a pace that you know most people will never have to work out, and particularly people working you know in museums uh, wouldn't have to work out. Uh, and um, I, I always say we, we uh, you know we would it was a good example uh, when we were installing some of the large objects that needed to come in, you know, before certain um, doorways became restricted and the like. And um, we had a particular day that these were due to come in. 
And uh, sure enough, they came in that day, but they were probably about two or three hours later than was intended. Now, you know, in museum world, that's not really going to be a drama. Um, but in, you know, building a, a major building uh, to a very tight timescale mode, it is a major drama. We would see, you know, these Pantechnicum lorries coming up the street. They'd unload, they'd get out. 30 seconds later, another one would arrive. And so being three hours late was hugely disruptive to the, the contractors. And so for me to see our team adapt the way they did, it was extraordinary. And I've got nothing but admiration for them. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Wow. Um, well, I want to, uh, I feel like we could, we could talk for... Uh, for much longer about so many of the stories and the different things you've done, but I really want to ask you some of these questions from Leadership Express. I always enjoy the answers. Yeah, go for ready? it. Okay, so what is a book that you've gifted to other people? Well, I think uh, yeah, we talked about this earlier. There's about three books that I that I uh, gift. One is the Biggest Estate on Earth uh, by Bill Gamage, which was a, a one of a number of seminal texts that that totally redefine. Uh, the way that Aboriginal people, or the way we think of Aboriginal people managing the land uh, in, in Australia, a really important book. So I, I must admit, I've given that to uh, uh, to a few people uh, along the way. And then uh, another one that um, probably is less well known, a lot of Australian listeners, if there are any listening to this, uh, will be familiar with... Um, <laughs> Bruce Chatwin, who wrote a book called The Songlines, which in itself can be quite a controversial book, depending on how you um, uh, you think about it. So he actually wrote another book, uh, well, he wrote m many books, but he wrote one called On the Black Hill, uh, which was very much about the country near where I grew up in uh, in rural sort of West Midlands. Uh, it was about two, two brothers. Yeah. And it's an absolutely beautiful book. And it... Um, you know, it always brings a tear to my eye. I won't give away the plot, but it's uh, it's beautifully written, and uh, uh, and that's one I've, I've certainly given. The other one I've given a few people lately uh, was uh, Donald Horn's The Lucky Country, because I, I get sick of hearing people invoking the lucky country uh, as, a, as a phrase to explain how lucky we are, because that was never what Horn meant by that. Um, it was it was an ironic thing saying you know, basically saying Australia was lucky because uh, you know it had all these assets that it um, you know was fortunate to have so it was almost suggesting it was uh, it, it, it was um, successful despite itself well it, that phrase has been appropriated by lots of people since to mean something quite different so I've given that book a few times to to put a few people straight. Yeah, that's fantastic recommendation. What about right now? Are you in the middle of any uh, any great books? Are you listening to any podcasts that you're really enjoying? Any any books uh, you're following? I'm, I'm very old school. I read books, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. yeah, I'm I'm reading um, Stan Grant's Australia Day at the moment. Um, I, um, I I love uh, to listen to and read Stan Grant. I don't always agree with everything he says, but. Uh, I agree with a fair, a fair amount of it, and it's certainly always worth uh, worth reading. Yeah, that's um, <laughs> that's that's great. I'm loving some of these recommendations. Uh, so, next question: Do you have any favourite questions that you ask? You're in a one-on-one. -on -one, you're in an interview with someone. You're you're with your team. You're with some stakeholders. Are there any interview? Uh, any sorry, not interview. Any any favourite questions that you ask? <laughs> uh, that's. That's a difficult question. I, I, I guess for me, uh, and particularly, uh, and I can't say that I've asked it in these terms, but it's the question I'd want to ask anybody: uh, is is what's important to you? You know, and and if it if it was a job mm, interview yeah. or if it was a potential sponsor, you know, what is it that's important to you? Um, because I think from those sort of questions, you get a lot of sense of people's uh, depth and commitment and integrity sometimes. Yeah, I love that question. I think it's I think it's such a simple one, but I think all of us could stop for a second and, and think, huh, have I asked that question with um, you know, people on my team? Is there anyone in my life who I could next time I'm catching up, I could 
you know, ask a version of that question. I think it's really insightful because we often assume the answer and sometimes people can really surprise I, us. I must admit, you know, the, um, uh, I've always said, and I mean, it's on a slightly different tack, but that, you know, when we get up in the morning, particularly in terms of our, you know, we should always uh, ask ourselves why we do what we do, you know, why are we doing it and why is it important to us? And, and I think uh, Simon yeah. Sinek has sort of coined that, and I feel, you know, damn, why didn't I say that, you know, 30 years ago? But anyway, <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. You could have had you could have had start with why before he <laughs> exactly. had start with why. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, is there a recent leadership lesson that you've learned for the first time or been reminded of? Yeah. Look, I, um, I do believe we learn every day, so I'm not suggesting I'm. Um, even at my advanced time in life, I've learned everything. Um, but it is, um, you know, it, you do learn it and relearn it every day is, you know, take nothing for granted and expect the unexpected. And I see that all the time. And I, I just, you know, reflecting on the obvious and, uh, I'm not sure what the currency of these uh, podcasts is and when people, how long people might be listening to them. But, you know, we, we do this as um, in WA, we're just probably reaching the peak of our COVID uh, infections. We do it um, in mm -hmm. the third week since uh, Russian troops marched into Ukraine. And, um, you know, all around us, there's so much mm. entropy in the world. And, uh, you know, that translates yeah. at every level. And it certainly translates uh, into our day to day uh, and into our work lives. So it is about, I suppose the other thing is, and, and it's something that I talk about a lot. And, and, you know, in government, we spend a lot of time developing policies and strategizing, all of which is important. But I'm a great believer in what I call opportunistic leadership. And um, you really mm. need to ensure that you are placed to react um, quickly uh, and effectively to both opportunities and threats that come before you. And uh, uh, it's a lesson I learned a long time yes. ago and I relearn it every day. Yeah, that's wonderful advice. Have you, have you uh, read Jim Collins' books, uh, uh, Good to Great? I'm just trying to think of the one that he's written most recently or more recently, which is about companies that thrive in really tumultuous industries or times i, I can't remember what it's called um, have you, have you come, across come, any yeah, of his work? come across good to great i'm not familiar with the more recent one but but yeah it, it is you know i mean it's that old cliche about you know the only thing that's constant is change and change is opportunity and all of that but it's true <laughs> It's uh, it's funny. You just reminded me of the book. It's called but it's called Great oh. by Choice, um, and it's all about companies that thrive mm. in uncertainty, even chaos. It, he he researched the question, or or perhaps the question came up in his research. Him <laughs> that might be a better way to put it. But about how much luck has to do with companies that are in these really uncertain times, and it was fascinating because. I think he, he sort of talks about saying, well, in these really difficult industries, he assumed there would be quite, you know, there'd be, a, there'd be some element of luck. But what it turned out to be was instead, it was much more to do with what you just said, which is why it reminded me of it. He said it's, it's the way companies dealt with risk and mitigated uh, risk when it presented itself and the way they took advantage of opportunities. The difference between the companies that thrived and those that didn't wasn't how lucky they were to get opportunities or not have risk. In fact, some of the greatest organizations had to mitigate massive risks more than companies that didn't end up being great. And some of the companies that didn't end up being great, if you look at it, you actually see that they they were in sectors that had some of the biggest opportunities and they failed to capitalize on them. So he talks about rather than whether a company is lucky, it's actually all about how well we react to opportunities and how well we react and mitigate un unforeseen risks. That was one of his biggest findings in that book, which um, 
which makes a lot of sense but i think it's i think it really does double down on your point there that one of the greatest challenges for leaders is to put yourself in a position and your organization in a position where you can uh react well to opportunities and any other yeah I, I totally endorse that and recognize it I, I mean again you know we we can throw out all the cliches but they're actually true about making your own luck um <laughs> you know i remember uh, years ago um in the uk uh at china Weir, actually we had to bid to become one of the lead regions uh, in a a project called Renaissance in the regions, and and we we became one, and we got the there were only three out of the nine regions got the big funding, and we were one of them. And I remember being at, a, at an event, yeah. and some young woman said to me, she said, "Oh yeah, you're one of the one of the lucky ones, aren't you? Uh, because we've got it." And and I must have been feeling a bit um, uh, a bit snarky at the time, uh, and I and I said, <laughs> "Yeah, it's amazing. The harder we work, the luckier we get," you know. And and, and um, <laughs> it is that that thing. I, I mean, you know, I think it's true here. And again, museums probably traditionally, by the very nature of their work and their longevity and the sort of things they look at, you know, tend to be uh, or have tended probably in the past. Uh, I wouldn't say so now necessarily, but tended to be quite sort of um, stable organisations, not particularly fleet of foot. Um, and and mm. that's what we had to do to gain the support that we did to build this this new museum. And we, you know, there are a whole range of things that we we took on. I mean, one of the things I've got a a, a couple of colleagues who, again, I mean, they were just phenomenal. Um, there's a, uh, down in the south of WA. Uh, there's a facility called the National Anzac Centre. So the Anzac, you know, the Australian New Zealand. Uh, uh, Army Corps that, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a huge tradition now uh, in uh, Australia, the Anzac tradition. Uh, and the National Anzac Centre, which is where they all gathered before they went off to the, the First World War down in the, uh, uh, on the coast off Albany, um, has become a really important place. Well, we, we took on the kind of design and development of that, a ridiculously short time scale. Uh, and you know, on the face of it, we should never have achieved it, but we did. And that down to the incredible staff that we have, who again worked at a pace uh, which was unbelievable. And, you know, it wasn't that I had staff waiting around wondering what they were going to do for the next 18 months. Uh, they had to sort of fit this in uh, to their work programs. And that was just magnificent. But, you know, it's that that ability wow. to, to use what has become a, a um, you know, kind of current trendy phrase probably won't be when people are listening to this podcast in years ago but to but to pivot <laughs> uh, and so we pivoted and yes. uh, you know we did that i can point to about five occasions where we did that and i think they were they were the reasons that we achieved yeah. what we achieved because we were able to do that yeah that's uh that's an incredible achievement um so last question if you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader what would you say look i i think it's um and it sounds a bit trite and, and it has to be uh you know taken in the count of you know make make sure you you sort of uh, being sensible about it but believe in yourself um i guess for me uh in my early days i probably lacked quite a lot of confidence and it's very easy to be overwhelmed um but you know, I would I would go to meetings uh, when I was a you know young curator, and there'd be other people there who know each other, and um, you would just automatically assume that they knew more than you, and you know they were better than you. Uh, so it is about. I mean, I believe you know about ninety percent of achievement is belief, frankly. Um, and so for me, mm. you know, believe in yourself, and um, you know, if, if if you believe in yourself other people will believe in you. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Wonderful, wonderful advice. Well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. This has been uh, such a fun episode and it's just been great hearing some of Alex's story. And uh, for our listeners, don't forget, I also have the John O'White Leadership Podcast and Leadership Question of the Day, another podcast that you can check out if you want to invest in your leadership but I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to Alec. It's been a joy to spend some time with you, to hear some of your stories and also some of your wisdom um, around uh, 
you know the the quote you mentioned from the from the character used to work with two ears and and one mouth um you know taking a clue and just a bunch of other things it's been i i just have really appreciated some of the uh like we've said some of the cliches that we've talked about that they're cliches for a reason because they actually really hold true and they make people's lives better when we lead uh when we lead well using them so thank you so much for being so generous with your time Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and and please do that. And look for me, John O. White or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. 
So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.